So um, we're going to look at uh, Romans 9 here in a little bit, and, and I'm, I'm going to walk into this a little bit differently than, than I have been doing. Normally, when we go through a book in the Bible, I try to take it somewhat verse by verse, uh, section by section. I try to simplify it, and we're going to do that, but, but I want you to know that the passage that we're going to look at today is a very difficult one. It is very difficult because of the theology that we read in it, and on first glance, we, we see it kind of... In, in a shallow kind of way, we, we take it for face value, and that's what we should do, but, but we miss some things in it. It's kind of like, uh, if you guys remember the movie or if you read the books, uh, The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, and you got this wardrobe, and it looks like it's just a wardrobe. That's all it is. There's just some coats in it. But once you get inside, you realize it's so much bigger than just a wardrobe. That's what this passage is. It is so much bigger than what we read on the surface, and if you read it leading into today... You probably read it and went, huh? What is he talking about? I don't get this. Or you might have come into it and gone, uh, this has got to mean something different than what I'm reading. Because it's one of those passages, uh, think about it this way. In Romans 8, Paul ends with this, this kind of thought, what can separate us from the love of God? And the answer is nothing. And it's almost as if Paul does, but there might be something. And, and he starts to talk about some things that if you were in that early Roman church, if you were one of the people in this church in Rome that Paul is writing to, you would have had some questions come up. You would have had, by the time you're done with chapter eight, you would have gone, okay, I get it. And again, it wasn't written in chapters, but you'd get past that section and you'd go, okay, I get it. Uh, nothing, if God is for us, who can be against us? I get it. But, but wait a minute, didn't God choose Israel? Did, aren't they his chosen ones? Like, what's happened with them? And if he chose to save Israel, and he chose them, and he was, wanted to save them, then does that mean that all these other nations, like Rome, God didn't choose? And if God didn't choose them, does that mean that God actually chose the people that he didn't choose to go to hell? It raises a lot of questions, doesn't it? it, it it's, it's as if we kind of go, well, okay, God loved some, he loved the ones that he saves, but he, does he really love the ones that he doesn't save? Does he really care about them? And, and what happens is we get caught up in some of the theology and, and our limited ability to understand the depth of God's love. We get caught up in it, and what happens is we, become, we, we start to divide ourselves. Many, many churches have divided because of this passage. People have left churches because of what we're gonna read. Because in our heads, we cannot understand fully the love of God. And there's things that we've been taught about the love of God that we really like. And then when we hear things that we don't like, we're not sure what to do with them. And so we do one of two things. We ignore it and many, many leaders and pastors skip this passage because it is difficult. So we just ignore it and hope that it just works itself out or we run from it. And so I'm going to ask you this morning to kind of open up your minds and your hearts a little bit because here's, here's the, the big question that this passage is going to answer. And we've heard people say this and we have probably even thought it or felt it or we might be feeling it right now. If God knew that I wouldn't choose to believe him, then why did he make me? Because if God knew, what we find out in chapter eight, if God knew me before I was created and he knew that I wouldn't choose to believe him, then that means he chose me, he made me, he created me to go to hell. That must mean he doesn't love me. And that's a tough one to wrestle with. It's very logical. In our brains, it's a very logical step. The problem is Romans 9 pushes back on that. And it changes the way we think about God. And so this passage should be for the church a hardcore gut punch, like a Cobra Kai chest punch, like, like the roundhouse kick to the face that, that you don't see coming and it just blows you away and you're like, okay, what do I do with that? So I want you to take this passage, I want you to open up your, your eyes a little bit, open up your hearts a little bit, and, 
And despite everything you've ever been taught, I want to try to make this very simple. And then let it just kind of surgically cut you up and push back on some of the things that that you have maybe always been taught or maybe always believed about God that may or may not be right. And and as we do this, um, I'm going to say, I'm going to take you to one verse in Romans 9, and we're going to look at some of the surrounding ones. So that's why I'm doing this a little different. We're going to look at one verse in Romans 9, and it is probably one of the most controversial verses, if not the most controversial verse in the entire Bible, and it's a quote from the Old Testament. It's a quote from God himself. And so it's going to be a very difficult one because when we first read it, you're going to go, wait, this doesn't make sense. This is not the God that I've always been taught about. If you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 9. If you've got the app, you can open up an app. Romans chapter 9. I'm reading from the uh, Christian Standard Bible version. Romans chapter 9, we're going to look at one verse, and then we'll kind of hit some other ones along the way. Verse 13, you ready? Here we go. As it is written, I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. What do you do with that? That's God talking. What do we do with that passage? A uh, 19th century um, Scottish uh, preacher by the name of um, Ale- uh, uh, Alexander McLaren had this way of kind of dissecting scripture. He would take a text and he would divide it into three equal sections. And then he would, he would process those three sections. And unfortunately, that's where the message cut out. We lost some power and uh, we lost the internet. And so uh, we'll pick it back up, but I wanted to kind of fill in the gap that you may have missed in the message. At this point, we're getting ready to break apart Romans 9.13 into three sections. The first section that we see is where Paul says, as it is written. Here, Paul is establishing the authority of God's word. He is establishing that God's word matters. And so he's quoting God's word. And for him, God's word was the Old Testament. And he goes back to Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, where the people of Israel are told by Malachi, God says, Malachi, tell the people of Israel that I love them. And so he says, God loves you. And they respond with, yeah, but we don't feel like it. We feel more like Esau than Jacob. You know, Esau and Jacob, the the two brothers, the, the older brother Esau is supposed to get the birthright, but Jacob tricks him and takes his birthright from him, steals it, uh, tricks him into giving it up. And, and then the rest of Esau's life is just met with feeling like they're on the outside look. He's on the outside looking in, and here's Jacob getting all the blessing. And in essence, they're telling God, we feel like, we feel like Esau. But you see, you got to understand what was going on in the culture of that day, too. The Jews, they believed they were chosen. And, and they were told that they were chosen. They had been adopted by God. And they thought by virtue of being chosen that things should be better for them and easier for them. That, that they should get all the benefits of, of being chosen without having to go through anything. And, and the problem with that is that had infiltrated the early church. And so for the Jews and the Gentiles who are coming together, especially in Rome, uh, there was this almost racist atmosphere that had been starting to spark up. Then the, the Jews are kind of pushed out of Jerusalem, and so most of this church is made up of Gentiles now, made up of Roman citizens. And they're going, in their mind, they're going, yeah, but wasn't, weren't the Jews the chosen ones? Weren't they the ones that adopted? And Paul, in chapter 9, at the very beginning of it, in the first five verses, he establishes that that is true, that God will go to great lengths to save those he has chosen. And he, in verses 4 and 5, he actually gets into it where he says, yeah, God went to great lengths, especially when it comes to Israel. He adopted them. He chose them. He he decided to uh, display his glory through them. He gave them the covenants, uh, the law. Uh, He he gave them uh, the the whole concept of the temple and the services that go on within the temple and all the practices there. He gave them promises. He even gave them all of the, the stories and the reality and the, and the examples of all their ancestors. In fact, God had chosen Israel, the Jews, to be the one that he brought about the promised Messiah that would be the, that would be the Savior of the entire world. 
He was trying to reach Israel. And yet he goes on in verses 6 through, through 12 and he says basically this. He goes, but just because you're, you're chosen doesn't mean that you automatically get saved. That's not how it works. And, and we'll see this more in Romans chapter 10 uh, this next week when we get ready to dig into it. But, but and because I think that whole idea of getting saved is really, I got saved, has really become a problem idea, ideology within the modern church. We'll get into that next week. But, but Paul, he, he's saying that just because you've been chosen doesn't make you saved. And he says that in verse 6, that, that not all of people that were born in Israel were really Israel, were really those chosen ones. And there's a lot of layers within this passage that, I, that we don't need to get into. But, but just because you have a certain ancestry and nationality doesn't get you saved. Just because you have a certain church affiliation or, or you, you have some type of religion doesn't make you saved. Just like putting on a, a pro football Dallas Cowboy jersey and going to a pro football game, a Dallas Cowboy football game, doesn't make you a Dallas Cowboy pro football player. It, He's, he's establishing that, that just because a group of people are chosen doesn't make them saved, doesn't get them free, free tickets into the end. And that's as he's establishing the authority of God's word, he acknowledges what God says. And, and he, th this brings us to the second part of that verse, the second section that we divided. And we looked at how God says, I have loved Jacob. And I want us to think about that for a second. Think about this. Jacob, the, the one who tricked and connived the birthright out of his older brother. The one who was lazy, who, who didn't do very much, who, who was thieving and a, and a scoundrel. The one, Jacob, the one who married two sisters but really only loved one of them and he just kept the other one out of convenience. Yeah, that, that Jacob. That's the one God loves? Why does he treat Esau this way? Jacob seems to be the bad guy in the whole thing, right? But that's where, where Paul, after this passage, he jumps into verse 14 through 18, where he, he reveals that God's mercy is evident through those he chooses in whatever way he chooses. He, he's the one who, because he's God, he gets to choose how he shows mercy onto whoever he shows mercy. Uh, in verses 14 through 15, it, it establishes that God is always just, that he is merciful to everyone until he chooses not to show mercy. And that is his right because he's God. He is the creator. He goes on in verses 19 through 29 where he basically establishes that God sovereignly chooses whoever he chooses because he is God. And he, he brings up this illustration of a potter, uh, that God is the potter and and who are we as the the pots to question the potter of why he makes certain pots for this and certain pots for that. You know, God is the one who, as the potter, he established this whole idea of, of being saved, of a saving plan. And he, all he expects is for the pots to, to respond by in humility and turn to him. And if they do that, they will be saved. You see, only a self-righteous person would try to justify an accusatory approach to the potter, to the creator, and say, why did you do this? Why did you make me this way? Why did you make it this way? I, I'm questioning who you are. And so Paul, in many ways, is establishing that whatever our feelings are, they don't matter as much as our faith. Faith over feelings is more important. But we also have to understand in this part where he's talking about that, that he has loved um, that he has loved Jacob it, 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 his love is not based on anything Jacob has done both Jacob and Esau are sinful and, but for some reason he decided uh, he has shown a, a different kind of love to Jacob and, and we don't know all the details of why uh, but we do know that Joca, Jacob chose to follow God we don't know much about Esau after that story and so that helps us establish a couple things that, that we begin to see that there's, there's a general love that God has for everyone, that, that it's, this is for all of mankind. This is the first part of God's love that we, that we can distinguish is that he has this general love like, uh, for God so loved the world. 
Um, it's, it's his general goodness that is poured out on a believer, but it's also poured out on an unbeliever. It, God heaps his goodness and his kindness and love on us, and he blesses us. And yes, some people to uh, some people appear to have more blessings than others. Some people have more wealth than others. Some people have more uh, a better position than others. Some people have better health than others. Some people have more opportunity to succeed uh, in, in the way the world sees success than others. Some people are given more intelligence. There are some people who are better preachers than others. There are some people who are given more hair to cover up their imperfect heads than others, right? And so, yeah, God is the one who does that, and he can do that. But those blessings don't establish whether you're saved or not. Those blessings are just opportunities to grow. And in fact, this whole idea of God's general love is designed purposely to draw us to our need for a savior. This non-saving love, this general love, doesn't save a person. It's meant to lead a person to realize how much God loves them and wants to save them. But some of those things can get in the way. Uh, Jesus says this. He says that it's uh, it's nearly impossible for a rich person to understand their need of a Savior. Uh, he says it in, in Matthew 19, 23. It will be hard for a rich person to experience the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because they've got everything they need. If they have everything in life, they don't feel like they need a Savior because things are going great, right? In Psalm 73, Asaph, he's going to the temple to worship and he looks and sees all these rich people showing up who don't seem to really believe in God. They're just going to the temple to, to worship because that's what they're supposed to do. And they're getting all these blessings. Uh, and, and in his mind, in his prayer, in his response, he goes, he says, it, it would almost be better if I didn't believe because I would get those same blessings that they are. That's God's general love that, that Paul is 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 somewhat referring to, but there's also another kind of love that, that Paul is going to dig into a little bit, and that's God's elect love. Um, the way that, that we can understand this is probably through an illustration, and, and this is the illustration that I kind of uh, think that makes sense, at least to me. When we had our kids, I had four daughters, and when, when we had them, we would go to church, you know, and we'd bring this baby to church, and we'd take our baby to the nursery, and we'd drop her off in the nursery, and uh, a lot of lessons behind that, a lot of reasons behind that that are really good for our kids to learn, uh, especially early off as, as babies. They're learning that we love them and they're, they're learning that other people can love them, but they're also learning they're also learning that mom and dad love them enough to come back for them. And so we're teaching them that, right? And, and, and so we would take them to the nursery and then we'd go to pick them up from the nursery and, and we'd do something very weird, very strange, we would elect which child we loved more. We loved all the children. We loved all those babies. Some are crying, some are happy, and you just watch them, and you're looking at them. You're like, man, man, the babies are amazing, right? And But there's one that we elected to love differently. We would grab our daughter, and we would take her home with us. We would, we would, we would give her a different level or different type of love uh, because she was ours. She was our child. If we were to take somebody else's child, we'd get arrested. Things wouldn't go well, right? And trust me, there are many times when we maybe thought about maybe a different kid would be better and easier to deal with, right? But, but you got to understand there's a difference between God's general love and his elected love. So that's where the message gets back in. We're going to jump back into the message and uh, thank you for following along. But it's because we had an elected love that was different than the other kids. It's not that we didn't love the other kids. We loved them. We just didn't want them as much as we wanted ours. Because we knew what ours was like. And who knows what we're going to get if we take somebody else's kid home. Right? And I know that's a weird illustration. But that's kind of the, the way to think about it. Because... There's this general love that God has, but there's also this elect love that he has. And how he can have both of those, and both of those be okay, doesn't make sense for us, because it feels like God is choosing that kid over this kid. And in a way, he is. In our limited minds, that's how it looks and feels, but that's not how God operates. 
all of us, believers or unbelievers, get to experience the greatness of God's love and his general love. But there's a different kind of love that's life-saving, that's life-giving, that when we accept this gift, it changes everything. Let me see if I can illustrate this. Um, I'm going to ask for a volunteer. Charles, will you come up here a minute? Okay, okay, that's fine. Uh, Cameron, come here, come here, come here, Cameron. Come here. Yeah, yeah. All right. I'm going to have you do something. I want you to trust me, okay? Trust me, okay? Can, can you uh, flap your arms like a chicken? Yeah. Yeah, just go ahead and be a chicken for a minute. Yeah, yeah. You know everyone's watching you do this right now, right? Yeah. Okay, good. All right, so, very good. Here you go. I'm going to give you this. Thank you for being a chicken. There's $25. Okay, stay right here. Stay right here. Stay right here. It's a very simple illustration. Before church started, I chose you to come up here. But you didn't know that, right? I didn't talk to you, right? But I chose you. I was like, yeah, Cameron will do it. He's a sucker. No, I'm just kidding. No, I didn't think that. No, I thought, yeah, Cameron will do this. He's good. He'll, he'll do this. And so I chose you. But at some point, you had to choose, right? So kind of at the same time, we both had to choose. I chose you, but you also had to choose. And when you chose to trust me and you did what you were supposed to do, I blessed you, right? I gave you $25, right? Now, I want you to see, uh, again, watch how this works. Did you know that beforehand I asked Charles to do it and I told him to tell me no? And right now, he's going, man, he told me no. I could have got 25 bucks. I'd go up on stage and be a chicken, wouldn't you? No, you wouldn't, yeah. Um, so, so I asked him not to come up so basically, you have, you have received a blessing. You have received something because he chose not to. It's kind of different, isn't it? And now here's what I want you to do. I want you to, uh, I want you to um, look around, and I want you to choose somebody, all right? And I want you to choose somebody, uh, preferably in this section right here, this section right here, uh, preferably in the front row, Pref- I, and, and I would really like you to choose someone with red and blue stripes on their shirt. You can choose anyone you want, but they have to be in the first row and they have to have red and blue shirt, striped shirt in the front row. Go ahead and pick anyone that you want, but they have to have, oh yeah, yeah, that would be good. Yeah, that, man, I'm glad you chose that by yourself. That's perfect. All right, do you trust me? Okay, here we go. He didn't have to do the chicken thing because he's not, he's not like you. Yeah. Now, again, let me help uh, us understand this, all right? All three were chosen. Two of them chose to receive the gift. Two, two of them have gotten my elect love. I know, I'm not God, but you get the idea, right? One had to do a little bit more than the other one, but they were both chosen with the same outcome. Charles could have been chosen too. I just didn't want to give him any money. Um, does that make sense? And so all, the, all this time, it would be very easy for Charles to be starting to think, man, what a jerk. Matt doesn't care about me. He told me not to come up. That's how God's elect love works. Go ahead, sit down. Thank you, guys. Perfect. All right? We are sovereignly chosen to freely choose. And so when it comes to God saying, I have loved Jacob, he's loved everyone. But some appear to accept the gift differently than others. Here comes the hard part. Look at this last part, verse 13. Verse 13, the last part. But I have hated Esau. Well, when we talked about Jacob, we had to figure out the word love, right? And we had to spend some time in that. Let me just spend just a couple seconds in this word hated. Because it's a very important word that we have to understand. The word that Paul uses here is the Greek word meseo. And it means to, dis- to detest, to have hostility for. It's a very strong word. It's not light. And, and we've heard this phrase said that God loves the sinner but hates the sin. And we're called to love the sinner but hate the sin. Do you know that's not in the Bible anywhere? Find chapter and verse where it says, love the sinner, hate the sin. Find it. It's not in there. It's a phrase that we came up with that sounds really good and sounds really biblical, and there is some biblical principle behind it, but it's not in the Bible. 
In fact, if you read the Old Testament, you find time and time again that God actually kind of hates sinners. What do you do with that? How do you wrestle with that? How do you, how do you figure that out? Well, we gotta figure out how, to, how that word hate, what that word hate means. Hate can have two different meanings. It can mean to love a little less than, right? When, when Jesus tells the disciples, if you wanna be my disciple, you need to hate your father, mother, wife, children, all that kind of, like, and that sounds aw- like awful, but he explains it in Matthew 10, where he basically says, if you wanna be my follower, you're gonna love me more than those other things. You're gonna love me, and you're gonna love those things just a little less. So it could mean that, or hate could actually mean hate. God, think about this, God hates anything that is opposite or an enemy of his holiness. Anything that's contrary to his holiness, he hates. He hates sin. Does he send sin to hell, or does he send sinners who've rejected him to hell? He sends sinners to hell, right? In, in, in essence, you can't separate the sin and the sinner. The only way you can separate the sin and the sinner is if the sinner accepts Christ who died on his behalf. And so on the surface, it feels like sinners are Esau and, and Christians, and I know Christians are sinners too, but, but Christians who have committed to follow Christ are Jacob. And those Christians aren't anything like they should be. They're a mess. But God has loved them. And, and yes, God hates those who are contrary to his holiness. You're sovereignly chosen to freely choose. Paul talks about this at the end of Romans 9. In verse 30, he brings up this tension What should we say then? Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained righteousness. How did the Gentiles who didn't understand the law, who didn't try to live for God, achieve righteousness? Namely, the righteousness that comes from faith. They achieved it by putting their faith in Christ. And the people that it should have been easy for them to put their faith in Christ, the Israelites, look at this. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not achieved the righteousness of the law. Why is that? Because they did not pursue it by faith. They tried to do it by works. They tried to earn it. And the principle that Paul is teaching is if you reject God's gift, your heart will become hardened and it will become more difficult for you to understand how faith and works almost work against each other because you'll feel like you always have to keep earning God's favor. You always feel like you have to keep earning your forgiveness and your salvation. You always feel it, but faith doesn't work that way. Faith causes you to change. You see, we've been chosen to choose whose we are only by the loving grace and mercy of God. And that's what Paul is talking about. Do you feel like God loves you? awesome. It's only by his grace and his mercy that you get to experience that and that you get to accept that. Do you feel like God hates you? I'm sorry, that's not, that's not what the Bible teaches. He hates your sin and he hates that you are contrary to him and he hates what your future is going to look like. He detests what is going to come if you don't follow him. So you're, you've been chosen to choose freely by your free will, but you've been chosen to choose. Romans 9 is intended to make us step back, step back from what we've always been taught, what we've always heard, and to wrestle a little bit. Is God loving? Yes. Is God angry and hates sin? Yes. Both. I know, we can't experience that. If we had a father who was angry all the time, we don't feel like that's very godly. And that's true. Only God can be both loving and angry at the same time. Why? He's the potter or the clay. He's the creator. And so 
when we think about this, let me give you some just real quick, some, some lessons, some questions that are irreducible minimum questions that we should be asking whether we're a Christian or not. So let me kind of wrap up chapter nine with, with just three very simple questions that you need to ask yourself. The first question is this, have you chosen God's gift? Next week, we'll look at Romans 10, nine and 10, where it says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that he, is ra- that he was raised from the dead, we'll be saved. We're gonna talk about that a little bit deeper. But the, the first initial thing is we have to understand, have you chosen God's gift? Have you chosen to put your faith in Christ? Have you chosen to do that? There's different ways that some of us have done that. Some of us have used uh, that, that process of confession. And maybe for you it's saying a prayer. But, but basically, confession is saying, God, I know I'm a sinner, and you're the only one who can save me, forgive me for my sins. It's, it's, it's acknowledging, it's a very personal, intimate uh, conversation between you and God. And it can be out loud, and it can have somebody helping you say that, but ultimately, it's coming from your heart, and you're just crying out to God to save you. It's very personal, it's very intimate. That, that, kind, of, that kind of process is very me-centered. It's, it's, it's for you. There's another way. For some of us, it's been the proclamation has been baptism, being baptized. That's a very public profession of your faith. And it's a great way to profess your faith. I think, this is what I believe, I believe confession is very personal, but I believe baptism, I think baptism is more for the unbelievers than it is for the believers. Because it's a public profession that I believe it, it's meant to be, whenever I have somebody that wants to be baptized, I always encourage them to say, well, do you have anybody that you know that doesn't go to church? Invite them to come to church the day you get baptized. Next week, we're doing a bunch of baptisms, right? Um, having a bunch of kids baptized, a bunch of different people are gonna get baptized. And so that, that's great, that's awesome. I would encourage you, if you're getting baptized next week, who are the friends, who are the people that you know that aren't Christians that don't go to church or that don't really seem to have a, a, a very visible faith? Bring them with you. They'll normally come. And it's a great way to, to, to profess your faith even to those. I think the third way that we do this, uh, that, that we profess our faith is through communion. I think Laura did a great job of reminding us what it's all about. I think that's important that we get that. But really, communion is for the believers to do together, to profess our faith together. So the first question is, have you chosen God's gift? How do you, how does that look? What did that look like, Right? Or what does that look like on a daily basis? Second question, do you love the people that God has put in your life? This is where it gets a little bit deeper, a little bit more intense. Do you love the people? At the very beginning of the chapter, Paul, his heart is breaking for the people of Israel. They're his people. They're his family. They're his friends. And they have chosen to reject the free gift of Jesus Christ. And his heart breaks for them, so much so that he, this is intense, he says, I wish that I, if, if I could give up my salvation and spend eternity in hell on their behalf, I would do it. That's intense. Do we have people that God has put in our life that we love, that our heart breaks because they're rejecting the gospel? Are there people that we're praying for? Okay, ready? Here we go. If you have time to complain or gossip about somebody, you have time to pray for them. Before you start complaining about somebody, before you post something that you don't like that somebody did, take a minute to pray for them. We should be praying for the people that are breaking our hearts. We should pray for the people that drive us crazy. We should pray that our heart would be aligned with God's heart, that that we would love them the same way that he loves them. Another question when it comes to those people that God has put in our life, who is it right now that you have been inviting to church or that you've invited to church? It's a simple thing, but it's hard. I get it. It's hard to just break that into a random conversation about how the weekend went and how bad the Cowboys are going to keep losing. Um, just kidding. You know, like, like it's, 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 always, it's always hard when you're talking about something and say, well, hey, do you want to go to church? Yeah, it's weird, right? But God has put people in your life on purpose for a purpose. 
They need to know how much Jesus loves them. And one of the simplest ways is for them to experience, as, as Adam said, to experience his family. Last question as we wrap up. Do you trust God's word? This chapter is hard because it makes us feel like if I don't love God, then I wasn't chosen. And actually, I feel like I was chosen to go to hell. And it's hard because that's what our brain jumps to, but that's not true. God's word teaches something completely different. God's word never fails. I said this a couple weeks ago. It goes along with what I said about the people around us. If you have time to be on social media and watch TV, you have time to read God's word. Right? I'm going to go home today and I'm probably going to watch football. Mm, yeah, no. Um, they are on my fantasy football team, so I'm using their defense. So yeah, I'm kind of cheering for them today. But that's not the point. I'm not saying that we can't do those things. But how often are we digging into God's word and trying to grow in our wisdom and our knowledge of it? Knowledge is what you know about God's word. Wisdom is how you live it. Are we trying to grow in our knowledge and wisdom of it? How often are we pushing back on doing that? How often are we finding other things to do other than opening up God's word and just trying to understand it? Let me give you a very simple process for whatever, whenever you open up God's word, very simple, four steps. Read it, meditate on it, talk about it, and then finally practice it. Read it, read a section. You don't have to read big section, you can read a little section. Meditate on it, think about it. Let, let the spirit work through it. Let the spirit point out things that maybe don't make sense that you, maybe you need to dig into a little bit. Maybe, maybe there's something in there. If you're reading the Proverbs, you're reading stuff in there that's going, oh man, I, I, this is me, I need to change this. One of the places that we don't do very much, though, is we don't really talk about it. Verbalizing what we're wrestling with and what we're thinking about is huge in our faith. It helps us grow in our knowledge and wisdom more than we realize. That's why so many times people that teach kids learn more by teaching kids. One of the best discipleship things that we had students do when I was in youth ministry is having them help lead or help in kids' ministry or junior high ministry or, f- or fifth and sixth grade ministry. I, I would put them into those environments where they had to really wrestle with, do I really believe this or not? Because I'm going to be telling these kids this. Talk about it and then practice it. We've been kind of unpacking this phrase as we've seen in, in chapter seven and eight that we are saved and, and all leading up to that, we are saved by faith alone but not by a faith that is alone. We've got the Holy Spirit working in us. And those things that we don't understand, those things that we can't understand, the, the, the ideas of God's love and his hate and does he love me, does he hate me, we're, we're not told to try to figure that kind of stuff out. We're just told to believe. And it's only by his loving grace and mercy of God alone that we can understand what it means to accept the gift and, and to own it and for it to work through us. That's what the Holy Spirit is stirring. 